An elf told me that uh, time travel is possible, but it's, it is constrained in ways which are not normally part of our expectation of time travel. The way in which it's constrained is once time travel is discovered, you can travel as far into the future as you wish, but you can't travel into the past any further than the uh, moment of the invention of the first time machine. The reason for this is that before the invention of the first time machine, there were no time machines, and how can you take a time machine into a domain where there aren't any? <laughs> you see, it's just to, to preserve logical consistency. That's like saying you can't drive a car where there hasn't been a car driven before. That's right, you can't take a car where there are no roads. When, when cars were first invented, the main objection to them was, what are you going to do with this thing? <laughs> You know, there's nowhere to, you know, it can't go where a horse can go, so what good is it? Um, so here's a fantasy scenario, uh, which for a while I liked very much. It's that quantum physics and uh, nanotechnology and all this malarkey is uh, refined and focused toward the notion of building a time machine so that then uh, on the morning of December 22nd, 2012 at the World Time Institute in the Amazon, the first time journey is about to be taken and the whole world is watching on holographic television as the lady temponaut is strapped into the machinery that will hurl her centuries into the future. And there's a countdown and a button is pushed and off she goes. Now most people's interest would be to follow this woman wherever she's going, but let's forget her for a moment. The point has been made, she disappears, we assume she went off into the future. But what happens right there, right then? It seems to me in the very next millisecond, thousands of time machines would begin arriving from the future simply because they had driven to the end of the road. They had come back in time to witness the first journey into the future. It's as though you could take your Piper Cub and fly it to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1906 to see the right flyer take off. You see? Are you all with me so far? Yeah. Oh yeah, right. <clears throat> now, there's a problem with this, which some of you I'm sure are thinking, I hope anyway, uh, which is what's called the grandfather paradox, which is the old conundrum that haunts all time travel schemes, which is if time travel were possible, you could go back in time and kill your own grandfather. Well, then you wouldn't exist. Well, so then this sets up a uh, logical impossibility. Either you exist or you don't exist. And some science fiction authors have, have assumed that, that somehow massive influxes of synchronicity would preserve your grandfather. You know, you would approach him with your Saturday night special, but it would blow up in your hand, or it would ricochet off the St. Christopher medal he always wore, or something like that, because he cannot be killed by you, because in that case you wouldn't exist, in which case he couldn't be killed by you. And this troubled me for a long time then. What exactly would happen? in this situation if a time because the the according to Hans Moravik of the Robotics Institute of Carnegie Mellon University I mean time travel is no big deal the first paragraph uh, um, of this paper 
The last few years have been good for time machines. Kip Thorne's renowned general relativity group at Caltech invented a new quantum gravitational approach to building a time gate, and an international collaboration gave a convincing rebuttal of the grandfather paradox arguments. Another respected group suggested time machines that exploit quantum mechanical time uncertainty. The technical requirements for these suggestions exceed our present capabilities, but each new approach seems less onerous than the last. There is hope yet that time travel will eventually become possible, even cheap. So I then saw another possibility, and this is the way we can fulfill the expectation of Christian hermeneutics, and, but not require the second coming of Christ or the intercession of God Almighty into history or all these other extreme unlikelihoods. And to understand it, we have to have recourse to... Uh, um, physical model in a very simple realm of chemistry and physics, which is the Bernoulli gas laws. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with these, and they're very intuitive and easy to understand. Uh, we, have a, we have a cylinder, and it's a vac it contains a vacuum, and at one end of the cylinder we have a valve, and the valve is connected to a line which is connected to a tank of some inert gas, say nitrogen. So we open the valve to let the nitrogen rush into the cylinder uh, that previously was a vacuum. Now, what happens inside that cylinder, I think, is intuitively obvious to all of us. The pressure equalizes over all points equally. In other words, you can't have 50 pounds of pressure at one end of the cylinder and five pounds of pressure at the other. We understand that in a gas, pressure distributes itself evenly in order to achieve equilibrium. Okay, hold that notion in your mind. Now think of our world in the late 1990s uh, as a, 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 a sphere or a, or a cylinder of that sort and think of cultures as gases at various pressures and let's assign low pressures to the bare-assed folks in the Amazon and eastern Indonesia and let's assign high pressures to the folks in Manhattan and at Caltech and Cambridge and Los Angeles and London. Well, then we can predict correctly, in fact, what is happening sociologically on this planet. What is happening is that the high-tech cultures are totally overwhelming the traditional cultures. The values of Manhattan and Los Angeles are flooding everywhere, and in spite of the tiny lip service we give to shamanism and body painting, the truth of the matter is Amazon cultures are not really uh, making a major contribution at this point to the evolution of high-tech, global, information-dense electronic culture. Okay, that's the second level of this Bernoulli metaphor. So now let's go back to the situation where we send the Lady Temple knot off into the future. I'm not familiar with how they overcame the grandfather paradox, so we'll pretend that the grandfather paradox is very strong. I want to say something about the grandfather paradox. Okay, you'll, let me, I'm close to question time. Let me press forward relentlessly here. <laughs> Because the coffee's running out, I can feel it. The equilibrium density is dropping. Okay, so we send the Lady Temponaut off into the future, but now, with what we know about the equalization of high cultures versus low in a temporal medium, what happens, from our point of view, is that the rest of the history of the universe 
happens instantly. That even if it's billions of years of, uh, of human culture and downloading into machines and claiming star system after star system and so forth and so on, somehow that the state vector of all of those event systems collapses. I call this the God Whistle principle. It's that we can actually call God into history. We can summon the end state of human evolution to appear a millisecond after we successfully achieve the implementation of this technology of time travel in order to avoid all the paradoxes that would prevail if there was any extension to the post-time travel era beyond the moment of its inception. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a way of, in a sense, forcing the evolution of the universe and it creates the phase transition of the eschaton and uh, is, to my mind, uh, a practical... Um, it, it creates the basin of attraction within the domain of our own lives. Now, is there any kind of precedent for something like this, even metaphorically in our own experience? Well, it turns out, yes, there is in a kind of bizarre anecdote which should sober us considerably as we think about these things. When the first atomic weapon was built by the Manhattan Project in the desert of New Mexico. Fermi and Oppenheimer and all these people got together the night before the test at Trinity. And Fermi had a, a, a pad like this on which he had scrawled some equations and he had reached the conclusion in the week before that they were not sure how high the temperature would go when they triggered this device and Fermi had some back-of-the-envelope calculations which caused him to believe that the nitrogen in the atmosphere of the planet would begin to burn if they tested this thing and that they would in effect ignite the atmosphere of the planet and the whole and the fireball would spread around the entire planet and destroy everything and they spent half the night going over these things and they finally decided that the information necessary to make the decision was not available and so they said well hell <laughs> throw the switch you know at least it'll get to show those Japs and Germans that we mean business <laughs> so <laughs> and then of course it, it, the test was carried out the, the nitrogen did not burn and instead we were ushered into the glorious era of um, weapons of mass destruction um, so let me see, I've got some notes here. I think I covered everything. Um, what's interesting about this is that for the first time in this article by Frank Tipler called The Omega Point as Eschaton, he, he seems, and this is why uh, Paul is here, and I couldn't really get into it because it's crazy to repeat what you can't understand, but <laughs> by, uh, by an analysis and interpretation of quantum mechanics, Tipler reaches the conclusion that there is an omega point and that it does represent the funneling together of all the what are called world lines and he for purposes of mental uh, comfort sets it far in the future but in principle there is no reason to do that uh, 12 or 13 years ago, the Swedish cosmologist Hans Alfven wrote a wonderful little book called Worlds and Anti-Worlds in which he uh, made the suggestion that, um, that the uh, entire universe is what's called a, a vacuum fluctuation. Ex nihilo, literally out of 
nothingness. However, there's, there's a caveat, which is this creation ex nihilo can only occur if what's called parity is conserved. Now what this means is that um, these uh, particles which come into being out of nothingness must come into existence paired with their antiparticle. And so it comes into being, let's say, the, uh, an electron and an anti-electron, and they divide on separate trajectories and then they reconnect and collide with each other and parity is conserved. In other words, nothing really happened. No laws of physics were violated because they annihilated each other. Now for a long time, um, a while, this was thought to be entirely a kind of a theoretical construct. And, but then it was noticed that um, the theoretical models of black holes, which we referred to a few days ago, seem to imply that no radiation could leave a black hole, and yet certain kinds of black holes were observed to be giving off hard radiation in the form of X-rays. And it was realized uh, that what was happening was virtual uh, vacuum fluctuations were taking place in the vicinity of the black hole and because one particle went one way and one the other the black hole interfered with the conservation of parity and one of the particles was being sucked into the black hole and the other particle was flying off into the ordinary universe and being seen by astronomers as hard radiation. So the, the fact that this process goes on has now been confirmed. Well now an interesting thing about these vacuum fluctuations is that quantum physics places no upper limit on the size of a vacuum fluctuation. What it says is that the smaller the vacuum fluctuation, the fewer particles that are involved, the more likely the vacuum fluctuation is 